Look, there's always gonna be bullies. There's always gonna be racists. There's always gonna be liars. There's always gonna be unjust middle fingers. <laughs> now, a middle finger is one thing when you deserve it, but an unjust middle finger? <laughs> when someone gives you a middle finger and you don't know why, and they disappear, and you wonder, what was it? And you've gotta go to your grave and never knowing what it was. It was so unfair. It's gonna happen. And here's what you say. Let's talk today about the importance of being peculiar, a peculiar people, of being maybe a little bit weird, or as you know, young people might say, a little bit extra, a little bit different, a little bit outside of the norm, a little bit socially awkward on purpose, uh, being uncommon. Today I wanna to talk about the importance for your life of being uncommon. These characteristics, I believe, are necessary and helpful in your life. I uh, read years ago, there was a study about people's biggest fears. The number two fear that people always listed was death. The number one fear was public speaking. So you might have heard this before, but that means more people would prefer to be in the casket than giving the eulogy. It is strange how, we, what's your biggest fear? The most common thing was getting in front of a bunch of people, a bunch of eyeballs looking at me, two per person in most cases, <laughs> and, uh, and giving a speech, saying something, putting yourself out there. And so these fears actually can entangle us. We're in our desire to manage our reputations and what, the way people view us, we become slaves and we fit right in. And yet, the people we admire most in life are likely to give a speech, a presentation, a PowerPoint. They're likely to say something controversial. They're likely to press or present or give an idea that's not popular. And yes, they are likely to be accused, likely to be ridiculed. Someone's coming to mind right now. His name is Jesus Christ, who was all of these things, except for the PowerPoint. I don't think they had PowerPoint in Jerusalem. <laughs> but Jesus was all of those things and more. And so in, in a way to become like Christ, there is a part of us that has to become, I guess you could say, comfortable with being uncomfortable. And why? Because of rewards. Now don't fool yourself. Jesus likes using rewards as a motive. When I memorized the Sermon on the Mount all those years ago, that was the thing that stood out the most to me, was how often he said, what reward will you get? What reward will you get if you do this? What reward will you get if you do that? Here's the reward you'll get if you do this. There is a reward. There are uncommon rewards for uncommon people. There are extraordinary rewards for extraordinary people. Uncommon people get uncommon rewards, that's right. So let's get those rewards. Let's get it. Let's get it by getting freedom today. Freedom, freedom. We're going to get some freedom. Now, King David, a central character in the Bible, has captured the imaginations of people for a long time. For me, thinking about King David, one of the reasons King David stands out to me a lot is he he has quite a number of flaws. He does a number of things that, that don't seem good or right. And yet, unlike many of the other kings and people in the Old Testament in particular, God seems to have extra grace, even extra favor for David. He seems to like, lift up David more than everybody else. And I think it's worth meditating and asking the question, if, if that's true, why does that happen for David unlike a lot of the others? What is it about David that it seems to really get a hold of God's heart? What is it about this king that, that does this? It's a deep mystery I still haven't gotten to the bottom of, and you can take it or leave it, take it with a grain of salt or leave it. But I heard this from Juan Carlos Ortiz, who mentored me all those years ago. And this strange idea he presented was that there are three types of, of sin. The, the first type of sin is the sin of the flesh. That's the sin everybody, everybody can see. That's stealing, 
right? That's whatever, getting drunk or doing, doing some kind of visible, obvious sin. Old days, they used to say, don't smoke, don't drink, don't chew, don't go, go with girls that do, you know, or whatever. You know, the obvious, not all of those are sins, but anyhow. <laughs> then there is the sin of the mind. A sin of the mind is something that we're also taught not to do, but it's, it's more veiled, right? That, that's envy. It's contempt, bitterness, a deep unforgiveness. Maybe it's a spinning your mind in fear. Maybe it's pride and ego. Maybe it's lust, right? These different feelings that we have, that, that are in our head that we think about, the sin of the, of the, right? The Ten Commandments, the last one is, do not covet. Thou shalt not covet. It's a sin of the mind. But then, Juan Carlos said, there's a third, and that is the sin of the spirit. And this is one that cannot be written down in writing because it's just between you and God. And this is the weird one. It's between you and God. That nobody else would ever know. You would never get in trouble for it. But somehow you know. And to Juan Carlos, this was the worst kind. This is uh, Moses when God tells him to speak to the rock. But instead of speaking the rock, he hits the rock like he did the first time. And by the way, he hits the rock twice, so it's almost like he gets a second chance to not mess up. And what's even weirder about that story is the miracle still works. The water still comes out of the rock. God still provides the water, and nobody seems to know, and yet Moses knows. And you remember the punishment for that spiritual sin? He couldn't enter the promised land. That was the one. So I think, going back to David, the reason, maybe, this is just me talking, that David had such favor with God is I think he cared more about the spiritual sins than he did about the flesh sins, which were numerous. David cared more about pleasing and honoring God and lifting up God and being in God's presence than he was managing his own behavior. Take that or leave that. Today, Hannah read the story about the establishing of Jerusalem. Beautiful story. Goes like this. David, uh, King David uh, unites the tribes of Israel. They take Jerusalem from the Jebusites. And now it's time to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the city of Jerusalem, into the city of David. He's converted the fortress into his palace. They're going to bring the Ark. Now, you may recall the Ark of the Covenant from Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Nazi-killing golden box. Uh, this, this was, in the Old Testament, a very sacred, important um, artifact. In fact, it was the throne of God. Uh, God sat upon the throne, the Ark of the Covenant, between the cherubim. And wherever the Ark was, God was. So David decides to put the Ark of the Covenant on a wagon and have it pulled by ox because it's very heavy. But there's a problem with that for those of you who are scholars. The Torah says specifically that the Ark can only be carried by Levites and they have to be carried by hand on poles. So I don't know if David didn't know that or if he was in a hurry or maybe it was too heavy, but for whatever reason, the Ark is placed on this wagon and it's moving along on Bronze Age roads, right? Which are made of dirt. So what's happening is this cart is probably going bop, 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 bop. So they're already broke the rule by not carrying it. But now you can almost picture like God sitting on the throne going oh, 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 oh. It's, it's not appropriate, you know? And here's the ark bouncing around down the road. It finally gets stuck. And a guy, captain, in the, I think, in the army of Uzzah, a lot of people think it falls and he catches it. it. It also could be more that it gets stuck like in a pothole and Uzzah, just to add insult to injury, kind of decides he's going to kind of like shove the wagon out, right? And immediately when his hand or his shoulder or whatever touches the ark, he dies. And this dark sort of emotional blanket comes over everybody because they were excited about bringing it. And everybody's like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Terrifying. King David is afraid and angry at God, and they don't know what to do. And so they decide to put the Ark of the Covenant in one of the guy's houses, Obed, 
Obed Edom, I think Edom means is a Hebrew for guinea pig. <laughs> because they want to see what happens to this, this ark and to, and to Obed's family. So they put the ark in Obed's house for about three months. There it sits. And the Bible tells us, who knows, that Obed's house, we don't know what this means, but was extremely blessed. So that could be money, it could be health, it could be life, it could be something, a lot of good was happening. And they took from that observation, hey, the ark is good, we just broke the rules. Let's obey the rules, let's treat it sacredly, let's do it the right way, let's do it the way it's supposed to be done. And so this time, these 30,000 men in this parade, every six feet they stop and they make a sacrifice. They carry the ark on poles instead of on the thing. And King David, who likely the first time was dressed as a king and was all decorum and was marching like a military, now, to add respect, he's dancing and praising and he's dressed as a, who remembers? The choir remembers because they already heard the sermon. He was dressed as a priest, that's right. Dressed as a priest in, lin in linen with an ephod. And he's dancing like a wild man. Excited that the presence of God was coming into Jerusalem and everybody's celebrating and cakes and bread are given out and gifts are given to the people and there's much rejoicing. Here's a key observation from this story. King David sees dancing, praise, singing, and music as respect. Here's another way we can invert that. David saw the lack of dancing, the lack of praise, huh? the lack of carrying it on sticks, the lack of dressing like a priest as disrespect. And desired to dance with all of his heart before the presence of the Lord, even though it was unbecoming of a king. You see? Who pointed that out? Well, his wife, Michal, who was a princess. She was the daughter of the wicked King Saul, the foolish King Saul. Now, she was raised that kings dress like kings, and kings present like kings, and they have decorum, and they, this kind of thing. And here she sees her husband, the new king, dancing like a wild man. There's one point, apparently, where a bunch of girls are hooting and hollering at the king. He didn't like that. And she says something to the degree like, oh, my king, who is dressing and dancing like a half-naked man before the slave girls, or something like this. Doesn't like it. What does King David say? I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more, can you say it aloud? A little louder like. Yeah, okay, then this. And I will be one more humiliated in my own eyes. This is a king of Israel, you see? This is why God loves David so much. This is why. This is, the fit. this is it, right here. King versus king. Saul versus David. What does Saul care about? We see in his story. We've looked at it before. Here's what Saul cares, Saul cares about. Saul cares about glory. Here's the question Saul's asking. How do I get glory? How do I get approval from my men, from my soldiers, from my peers, from my enemies? Rarely asking it of God. Here's King David's question. How do I please God, even if I look like an animal, even if I look stupid, even if I look ridiculous? How do I please God? That is the question. That's a question. And what kind of, what kind of person does that kind of a question create? It's this, it's this strange combination of being deeply principled and wild. Deeply principled and wild. That's what I hope for you. Here's what people rewards look like. It looks like this. It's like a little golf clap. All right? That's what you take to your grave. But pleasing God gives us God-sized rewards. This is what we need in life. God-sized rewards. All right. Here's some things. A little smorgasbord of... Bobby's ideas for you for a little bit of freedom from people, okay? 
Number one, don't let little things cheat you out of big opportunity. All right, number two, practice a positive no. You know, you can say no in a positive way. Isn't that nice? A no seems like it's always going to be negative, but it's not. I learned this from a book from William Urey. It's a great process. You know, I say no to people all the time. I even say no. I say no to, I have said no to my closest friends multiple times. I've said no to my family members multiple times. Back when I had a boss, I've said no to my boss. I've said no on a couple occasions to board members. I've said no to people I really am trying to impress or help. I've said no. I've even said no one time to my daughter. Louis <laughs> just saying something. She's so charming and cute. I was saying no to Haven Schuler is very, very hard. Very hard. <laughs> Even for the strongest of us. But here's how you do a no the right way. You give a positive no. A positive no looks like this. Yes, no, yes. It's like a no sandwich. Yes, no, yes. So you're hiring for someone. Someone applies for a role. Yes, you're a talented person in this way. No, I don't think you're a good fit for this role. But yes, we have somewhere else we'd like to put you. You could practice other no's, like, I don't think so right now, but if I change my mind, I'll call you and let you know. See, it's not that hard, but it feels hard. Okay, it's a positive no. Here's the most important thing. Don't get in this horrible new thing where you leave people hanging. If somebody sends you an invite, if someone asks you a yes or no, if someone applies for something, let them know it's no, or yes, but let them know. Don't leave them hanging. As my daughter's generation says, don't leave them on red. <laughs> like, don't leave them hanging. Don't leave it just out there. Let them know, be honest. Respect yourself by being honest. Don't leave people hanging. Why do we say no to so, so many people that we love and care about? Why do we say no to so many things? It's so we can say yes to the good things. We say no to the good things so we can say yes to the great things. Okay? You guys say no to me all the time. I say no to you. It's fine. All right. <laughs> Number three. This one, is the, this one is worth the price of gold. This, this one, if, you are, if you're sleeping, wake up. If, you're about, if you want to write something down, write this down. This is, I don't know what it is about this idea. I've been practicing this for two years from Benjamin Disraeli, my, one of my all-time favorite quotes. Never complain, never explain. Try this. This is good. There's something about, there's something of self-respect in this and dignity that is very hard to, it's weird how often we're always trying to explain everything to everyone even though they're not asking for an explanation. You go to a restaurant. Would you like a, something to drink? How about a soda? I normally get a soda, but I'm not gonna get a soda today. I'm just gonna have a glass of water because I'm quitting soda for a month. The server doesn't care. <laughs> just say, I'd like a glass of water. It is amazing, watch. How often you explain something to people and they're like, okay. If they ask for an explanation, like your mother or your wife, you can give it to them and they will. That's what moms and wives do. But, uh, but if they don't ask for it, they probably don't want it, they just want the info. All right? You try that one. Next one, this is a good one. Become unoffendable. Become unoffendable. You wanna please God, just forgive people. It doesn't mean that what they're doing is okay or that, but forgive them. Let it go, especially with strangers. You can forgive a monkey for monkeying around. Did you know that? You, you can forgive a mule for acting like a mule. You can forgive a dog for acting like a dog. You can forgive a pig for acting like a pig. You can forgive a scorpion for acting like a scorpion. You can forgive a shark for acting like a shark. You can forgive a chicken for acting like a chicken. A man does what he does according to his nature, said Marcus Aurelius. 
And one of the best things you can do to help people change, to become the wonderful crea creatures that God has created them to become, is to forgive them. I was with a friend of mine years ago, and we were standing in line somewhere or something. And some guy, I think he got us mixed up with someone else, came up and gave this gnarly insult to both of us. And my response immediately was my, my fists tightened up and my teeth clamped and my brow furled and my heart rate went up and I was ready to let go or fight or something, I don't know. And my friend, seeming unscathed, looked at him and he goes, that's interesting. And the temperature went to zero. And I looked at my friend and I thought, wow, that's interesting. That's a good phrase, that's interesting. That's a good thing to say. If someone you don't know or you don't care, just that's interesting. It was amazing. And I've used it ever since. Here's what Jesus says. Blessed are you when people insult you. Why are you blessed when people insult you? Here's why. Because they can see you. You see? If people can't see you, they can't insult you. But people see you, so they're going to insult you. That's part and parcel. Uh, Taleb asked people, please ban my book. Please burn my book. One of the best things that could happen to me as a pastor is if on the, I don't know, the cover of the New York Times tomorrow, they said, all schools should ban Bobby Shuler's book, You Are Beloved, because God doesn't love everybody. I don't know. I'm trying to think of something, but... But attacking someone's book, attacking someone's message, attacking a person for their ideas is one of the best things you can do to help those ideas grow. Isn't that interesting? So don't get angry over words when people insult you, especially if it's because of your faith. Don't get angry over words. Why? Because anyone who can make you angry with words can control you. Get angry if someone gets physical. Get angry if someone steals from you. Get angry if someone betrays you. But if a stranger says insulting words to you, you can forgive. You can forgive them and move on and ask that the Lord would help you. Amen. You can say what? That's interesting. <laughs> Look, there's always going to be bullies. There's always going to be racists. There's always going to be bad ideas. There's always going to be liars. There's always going to be unjust middle fingers. <laughs> now, a middle finger is one thing when you deserve it, but an unjust middle finger? <laughs> when someone gives you a middle finger and you don't know why, and they disappear, and you wonder, what was it? And you've got to go to your grave and never knowing what it was. It's so unfair. It's going to happen. And here's what you say. That's interesting. <laughs> That's all it has to be to you. In Oklahoma, they used to say, don't wrestle with hogs, because you'll both get dirty, and the hog will enjoy it. <laughs> all right? Last one, don't judge. Just don't judge people. Unless God's put you in an office of judgment where you, you have to do that, and if, if you are in that rule, judge with grace, judge with love and kindness, be gentle on the person, but in general... Let God do the judging. You don't need to judge people. Here's why. Because when we judge people, it makes us hard to be that wild, principled person we're called to be. The more we judge, the harder it is to let loose a little bit. The more we judge others, the more we judge ourselves. The harder we are on others, the harder we'll be on ourselves. You guys remember Simon Cowell? From uh, American Idol? Who here has heard... Simon Cowell, sing. Anyone? You will never hear Simon Cowell, the vocal critic, you'll never hear him sing. Why? Why? Because everybody will do what? They will judge. Everybody will blow out the magnifying glass, any note, anything. See, this is a principle. When we judge, we cannot sing we cannot dance, we cannot be wild, we cannot break things, we can't go on adventure, we can't be outside the box, we can't take a risk, we can't mess up. 
The more, judge, the more you judge, the more common you become. The more you judge, the more ordinary you become, you see. And so your life gets smaller and smaller. Don't let your negative judgments get bigger than your dreams. Just like David, um, honor God with your life. Do whatever you can to honor God, even if you look a little crazy sometimes, even if you look a little weird. Just honor God with your life. Just say in your heart, Lord, all I want from life is to honor you. Amen. Finally, I would encourage you not to leave here if you're not at peace with God. I want to encourage you to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to forgive you of your sins, that you could be saved. And uh, if you want to make that decision, I encourage you to text me the word hope to the number on the screen so we can give you some materials. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for watching Hour of Power on YouTube. We hope this message encourages you. Like and subscribe below for more encouraging content.